Hello everyone, uh, Dr. Ross here with chapter one for uh, the GOB class. In this chapter, we will be looking at chemistry and other sciences, the scientific method, physical properties and chemical properties and physical and chemical changes. We'll be looking at matter classification, measurements, uncertainty in measurements, scientific notation and standard notation, significant figures, rounding, the metric table and some SI units, density, and then finally, the dimensional analysis method, also known as factor labeling or linear equations. Okay, so let me move that out the way, there you go. Okay, so chemistry versus other sciences. Chemistry is often referred to as the central science. Um, you can see on the diagram on the left, the central location of chemistry. This is based on its definition. So chemistry is defined as the study of matter and its changes. And matter is anything that has mass and uh, occupies space. So essentially chemistry studies everything. Um, that's why no matter what subject you might be intending to study chemistry is probably linked to it in some way so we can see here some common ones you've got physics over here you've got biology all the medical or health related sciences down here um, they all seem to point or link from chemistry in some way so there's a good chance that you are going to in, in encounter chemistry and you are obviously because you're here watching this video but putting that in another perspective um as shown here uh chemistry will be a valuable uh commodity for you a tool for you as you position yourself for career advancement so again chemistry is sent because chemistry is the study of matter. Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. So essentially, chemistry is everything. How do chemists do chemistry? Uh, the same way that most scientists do science, and this is not the only way that science happens, but it's uh, the Francis Bacon way, the, or the Baconian way, um, an historical early contender of how science is done known as the scientific method. So again, this is not the only way to do science, but it's an important one. The scientific method is shown as cyclical. So we can start by making an observation about the natural world, or we can observe something that seems to reproduce, and we call that a law, a reproducible phenomenon. Uh, we can make observations in two flavors. They can be qualitative, so the color of an object, the odor emitted by an object, um, typically qualitative observations have no units. Um, and quantitative observations typically come with units. So the length of an object, the mass of an object, um, the density of an object. Okay, once we make an observation, we can come up with a hypothesis or a hypothesis. Hypo means below. So a hypothesis is below a thesis, um, where a thesis we could translate to be a theory. This is below a theory, um, so it lacks any experimental validation. So it's just an idea or an educated guess. It has to be reasonable. It has to be testable, uh, but it's not based on anything other than possibility at this point. Then we can test our hypothesis by formulating an experiment. An experiment can prove or disprove a hypothesis. And regardless, we can just cycle back again. Um, because of the cyclical nature of the scientific method, you can imagine it's spinning in position. So you can go make no progress with the scientific method as it spins, or you can move forwards and refine um, your theory into a better theory, but it's pretty much impossible to go backwards. 
So there's no detriment to cycling through the scientific method. You might not progress, but you're not going to go backwards. Okay, physical changes, chemical changes, and their properties. So physical properties are inherent characteristics of a substance. So for example, think of the biometrics of you and I. So our eye color, uh, our sex, our height, our fingerprint. These are all things that would be unique and inherently inherent to us. So the analogies of regular objects would be density, which is mass over volume. Uh, the boiling point and the melting point of an object, whether the object is hard or soft. These are all things that are inherent to an object. They can be measured without altering the object. Chemical, on the other hand, uh, these are properties that tend to undergo change. So the flammability of gasoline is a property of gasoline, but it's a property that involves a change. In this case, you would have to set fire or burn the gasoline. The reactivity in water, you would have to actually fulfill that reaction and that would permanently change the property. Um, so if you measure a chemical property, it's a one-way thing. You can't measure the same thing twice, whereas you can measure a physical property repeatedly. Chemical properties are uh, changed when you measure them. Physical and chemical changes. So physical changes are reversible. Uh, they don't permanently alter the object. So for example, a phase change, like here phase means solid, liquid, or gas. You can change, for example, solid ice to liquid water and reverse it again without changing what, what it is that makes the water water. You can boil some water to make a gas. You can condense the water again to make a liquid all day long, and it won't change the water. So that's reversible. Chemical changes, on the other hand, uh, are irreversible. So for example, combustion, which just means burning. Uh, if you take some wood and you burn it to make ash and light and heat, and maybe some sound as the wood crackles, you can't take all that light, the ash, the light, put it in a box and then hope that wood's gonna appear. So there's a, an irreversible process that's occurred. Uh, there's definitely an arrow of time there that you can't go backwards. So chemical changes are irreversible. Aging is another example of a chemical change. We can separate mixtures based on physical or chemical characteristics. So the word physical here has the concept of reversibility, not permanently damaging the object. So you can physically separate a mixture based on physical or mechanical means. So filtration is when you can, for example, if you're filtering coffee, uh, the filter is a physical barrier so that the coffee can go through it, but the coffee grounds cannot. So it's a size exclusion, physical barrier. Um, distillation is where you use physical boiling point to separate objects. So for example, if you have two substances, A and B, and B has a lower boiling point, therefore substance B will boil before sub at a lower temperature and therefore before substance A. So you could use that preferential boiling of substance B to separate it from a mixture of A and B. Chromatography is separation of colors. Um, we won't do chromatography in this course, but you've probably witnessed it whenever you have, for example, a colored marker and you touch it on a piece of uh, kitchen, a paper towel that you use in your kitchen, the color will bleed up the paper towel and you'll probably notice it separate into colors. This can be controlled in a lab environment, um, but it's the separation of colors based on a preferential interaction of those chemicals having the color but more on chromatography in a different course. Centrifuging, this is where you separate based on mass. As you centrifuge, heavy things settle to the bottom, 
lighter things rise. So medically, this is how blood is separated into plasma and platelets, for example, via centrifugation. Chemical, uh, again, you're going to permanently attack one of the components in a mixture. It could be a thermal decomposition of one component in a mixture to isolate the second component. Um, voltage, this is where you can use the charge on an object and its ability to be manipulated in an electromagnetic field. A lot of uh, separation of things like amino acids or other charged objects can be done by preferential uh, pushing them between the plates of an electric uh, field. Okay, matter is classified as following. You can have pure substances or mixtures. Let's deal with the mixtures first. A homogeneous mixture is when the materials in the mixture, and by mixture, we mean two or more pure substances combined. If they're combined in a way that you don't see a physical difference between, there's no features to the unaided human eye. We call that same, the prefix homo means same. A uh, homogeneous mixture, they are of the same type, they look the same. So for example, wine is a homogeneous mixture because you don't see features of alcohol and water and sugar, you just see wine. Salty water or ocean water, you don't see the salts, you don't see the water, you don't see anything else that might be dissolved in the water, it just looks like water. It looks like a featureless um, object, so we call that homogeneous mixture. Conversely, a heterogeneous mixture, the prefix hetero means different, different as gauged by the unaided human eye. So a heterogeneous mixture, for example, could be cereal in milk. You can see cereal as the features, the, for example, if this were Cheerios, you could see the little O's clearly as a feature in the milk. So you can tell the O's from the milk. That's uh, something you can discern with the unaided human eye. Slightly more gross example is sewage. You can have your particulate matter versus your liquid matter. That would be a heterogeneous mixture. Looking over to the pure substances, they can be elements, and there are 118 elements in the periodic table. Any one of them would be pure. You can have a mixture of elements, so long as it's the same type of element. So here we have two hydrogens forming a diatomic molecule of hydrogen. That would be considered pure, so long as all of the molecules are identical. It's one type of element surrounded by the same type of element. This is true if you have a cluster of elements. So for example, if you have eight sulfur elements all clustered together in a sea of other clusters of eight sulfur elements, well, then you just got a big bag of sulfur. So that would be considered elementally pure. Conversely, if you have a compound, which is two or more uh, different elements combined. So for example, a water molecule is a compound because it has hydrogen and oxygen and hydrogen is not the same as oxygen, it's still pure because once they combine to make a water molecule, you can just have a collection of other water molecules. And statistically, if you grab something, you're 100% sure to grab a water molecule. You're not going to grab anything else. So therefore, it's considered pure, although it's a combined unit of other things. Um, and as we can see here, ionic compounds, we can see sodium and chlorine, for example, or potassium, K, and phosphate, PO4. These are different elements, but they form a unique whole. So long as they are in a, uh, a beaker full of other identical holes, then that would be a, a pure compound. Measurements. Typically, when we give measurements, we want to give three pieces of information. Uh, we want to describe the object. So for example, iron filings. We want to give the magnitude of the object. So here I've got 100.00. And then I have to specify the unit of the magnitude. So in this case, kilogram. So looking at these three pieces of information for iron filings, I've got 100.00 kilograms of iron filings. Morphine, I've got 00197 
microliter of morphine, etc. Final example, but you can infer the other two. I've got 56.4 degrees Celsius of water. So these are the three pieces of information you want whenever you take a measurement. Uncertainty in measurements. Measurements can be precise or accurate or both, and they can have errors. We want to maximize precision and accuracy. We want to minimize errors. So what's the difference between precision and accuracy? As the dartboard example shows here, these three darts have landed in a region offset from the bullseye. They're all clustered around the same location. So they are precise because precision is repetition or reproducibility. So whoever threw these darts in figure A is precise, but they missed the bullseye. So they are not accurate where accuracy is your ability to hit an intended mark or a true target. Figure B, you can see that these are not really reproducing anywhere in particular, uh, and they're not really hitting the bullseye, so this person is neither precise nor accurate. Over on the right, figure C, we can see that the three dots are clustered around the bullseye, so they've hit the mark, they're accurate, and they are reproducibly hitting the mark, so they are precise. Systematic errors and random errors. Systematic errors are errors that are within your control. Uh, I don't recommend you say the word human error because humans don't make errors. They might not be aware of systematic errors within their control, but they don't intentionally make human error. Um, so we can try and minimize, as humans in the lab, we can minimize systematic errors. Random errors are uncontrollable. Um, for example, the quality of the instrumentation you have in the lab, that's beyond your personal control. That would be a random error. Your ability to read a measuring tool correctly, that's within your control. That's a systematic error. Scientific and standard notation. Scientific notation is typically used, well, it can be used 100% of the time, but it's typically reserved for cases where there's large numbers preceding or proceeding a decimal point. So for example, in this example here, we have 527,500 feet. We, that's standard notation because it's just a regular number. We can choose to write that in scientific notation as 5.275 by 10 to the five feet, where the argument 10 to the power five tells us to move the decimal place from between the five and the two, five places to the right to regenerate the standard notation. So you can see if we were to put a decimal place between the five and the two here, and then move it five places to the right, we would uh, obtain the scientific notation value. Correct scientific notation must be written as a number between one and 10, and an exponent 10 to the power n, where n can be positive or negative. So it would be incorrect to put the decimal between the two and the seven, for example. Uh, if we look at the second example, 0 0.00004244 liter, we can write that in scientific notation as 4.4 by 10 to the negative five liter, where we can see we take the decimal between four and two, we move it five places to the left, and we regenerate the standard notation number. Significant figures are important numbers that come from reading correctly uh, a, a measuring device in the lab. More on that in another video. But once we have significant figures, we have to know how to report them and propagate them in calculations. So for example, if we're gonna multiply or divide a value that has significant figures, we want to propagate the least significant figures. So for example, volume here is the length times the width times the height. If we measure a length as 32.0 feet, which is three significant figures, 
a width as 13 feet, which is two significant figures, and a height as 8.04 feet, which is three significant figures, we would multiply them together and note that two significant figures is our least significant figure value. So we would have to only give a, a final volume to two significant figures. We do the calculation, we get 3,344 cubic feet. This dashed line, it separates the significant figures on the left with the insignificant figures on the right. And as practice, we're gonna give two insignificant digits at all times. We now have to round this value to our final two significant figure value. We follow rounding rules, which are gonna be in the next slide. But briefly, this would round down, this would not round at all because four is less than five. And essentially we would add a zero to the three, which would leave it untouched. And we just uh, don't report the insignificant digits. We report zeros instead because uh, it's order of magnitude 3000, not just 33. And if we didn't report anything, we would lose two orders of magnitude. So the final box answer is 3,300, uh, which is rounded correctly to two significant figures. If we are adding or subtracting, we want to propagate least decimal places, which also corresponds to the largest uh, absolute uncertainty AU. More on how to calculate AU in a subsequent video. But essentially, if we have to sum three values as shown, we have 12.05, that's two decimal places, 21, that's zero decimal places, 120.8, that's one decimal place. So the smallest number of decimal places is zero. That means we're not allowed to give decimal places with this final answer. We have to round it to zero decimal places. So 153.85, we have our dash line telling us that we cannot give any decimals. The eight, the first digit that's insignificant is greater than five. That means we add one to the last significant digit. So the three is converted to a four, and then we just ignore the final two uh, insignificant digits because we're not allowed to give decimals. So 154 meters is our final answer. Rounding. So uh, let me move, I have a, an instructional bar right in the way. Let me move that out the way, okay. As a good practice in this course, and I recommend in any subsequent course, you should give two answers to every problem, a non-rounded value with a dashed line as shown and two insignificant values, and then finally a boxed rounded value. As shown, if the two values that we are insignificant, if the first value is less than five, we add zero to the previous digit, and then we don't include the insignificant digits. So here four is less than five, we add zero to three, and then we just don't write the final four and three. In case number two, we can see that we have a five, and then we can see that the next number is an eight. So clearly the five would round up. So it's technically greater than five. Therefore we add one to the previous digit. So the three becomes a four and we don't write the five and the eight in the final answer. If it's exactly five as in case three and the next number is a zero. So it really is exactly five. We would add one if the, the previous last significant digit is odd. In this case it is, it's a three, which is odd. So we would add one to the three to make it a four and we don't write the insignificant digits. If it's exactly five, but the previous digit is even, we add zero and leave it as, as it is. And therefore it remains a four. Metric table and SI units. SI is an acronym for System International or International Systems. I would learn these in 
pairs. So I would learn Terra and Pico together. Terra is one by 10 to the 12 or trillion. Pico is one by 10 to the negative 12 or trillionth. Giga is one by 10 to the nine or billion. Nano is one by 10 to the negative nine or billionth. Mega is one by 10 to the six or million. Micro is one by 10 to the ne negative six or millionth. Kilo is one by 10 to the three or thousand. Milli is one by 10 to the negative three or thousandth. And then the odd one out, centi, is one by 10 to the negative two, which is hundredth. These are not all the metric units uh, in the table, but these are the commonly used ones that I would commit to memory. Uh, you can see here, based on an example of how they're useful, if we have to convert 0.52 inches into meters, we have to know um, how to convert meters to centimeters. Um, so we know here by definition, a meter is 100 centimeters. We would know, uh, so we'd have to, we'd be expected to know that. We'd be expected to be provided information about inches and centimeters because these are English or imperial, imperial units. So exactly 2.54 centimeters are in one inch. Uh, we can see that 0.52 are two significant uh, value input multiplied by these two exact conversions gives our final two significant figure output in meters. Density is an important property. It's an intensive property, which means it's independent of sample size and therefore it's a constant and it can be used to identify an unknown. You can identify important things like density or important intensive properties because there are always fractions where both numerator and denominator have a unit. So if you scale, you scale the numerator and denominator proportionally, so the scale cancels. Okay, density is mass over volume. Um, we can see here an example of how to use density. We're asked to, uh, you know, the example is kind of irrelevant. It's just to show the use of density in a calculation. What's the mass in pounds of a certain, a 1.2 gallon uh, of liquid helium, sorry, liquid um, mercury, my goodness, liquid mercury. We're told that the density of mercury is 13.53 grams per milliliter. Our game plan is to convert gallons to cubic inches, convert cubic inches to cubic centimeters, to convert cubic centimeters to milliliters, and then to gram, and then to pounds. We construct this backwards. So we want pounds as our final answer. So we write pounds here and we convert pounds to grams. We would find this uh, in a reference table or online. The denominator here precedes the numerator. So you can see this zigzag. So the gram here tells us to write gram here. We then convert grams to milliliters based on our density. So 13.53 grams of mercury is equal to one milliliter of mercury. The milliliter then precedes the numerator. We've got a conversion of one milliliter to one centimeter cubed. Centimeter cubed then becomes a numerator to the left. By definition, 2.5 centimeter cubed is an inch cubed. Inch precedes it as a numerator. Again, this 231 inch cube equal to one gallon, that would be found in a reference table. No need to memorize that. And then gallon is our input. Uh, our input multiplies these values, two significant figures, four significant figures, two is less. So we would have to round the final answer to two significant figures. For exact quantities, we just assume that they are always greater than the minimum significant figures. So we just ignore them in terms of significance. Dimensional analysis, we've just seen a great example of dimensional analysis in uh, the previous slide. In general, this is using uh, equalities or exact conversions multiplied by inputs to get outputs. 
Um, so for example, if you have to convert 958 feet to centimeters, you would start with the target, which is centimeters. You want to connect that with the input, which is feet by way of equalities. So variables that are set equal to each other. So by definition, 2.54 centimeters is one inch. We, uh, to delete inch here, we have to raise it as a numerator here. The inches cancel. We know that 12 inches are in one foot. We can cancel the feet here by the input feet here. And so we essentially have 958 multiplied by 12, multiplied by 2.54 centimeters. We know that we have to eventually round to three significant figures. So we write our three significant digits, our two insignificant digits. Here we have it in scientific notation. The nine that's our first insignificant digit is greater than five. So it's going to round up the one to make it a two. And then we just drop the insignificant digits. So our final answer is rounded correctly. And that is uh, an example of dimensional analysis.